uh, welcome back. Uh, this is our keynote speaker. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have been a friend of Ray's for quite some time since I came into the community. Uh, when I came here as an early American historian, I was thrilled to realize and hear stories that, oh, Ray Raphael lives in Southern Humboldt. Ray Raphael lives in Southern Humboldt. Uh, he is well known here for writing local history, like Two People's One Place, that the Historical Society published about 15 years ago, and I helped work on that to make sure it worked. Uh, but he was, he's really known nationally uh, as a, a prominent historian of the American Revolution and the American Constitution and the Founding Fathers. Uh, many of his works include uh, founding myths, uh, myths of the Constitution, the Constitution itself, uh, a people history of the American Revolution, and he's well, well known for this. Ray is, is not a PhD in history. He is a, a highly trained, self-taught scholar. Uh, he was a teacher for many years in Southern Humboldt, where he befriended my wife. Uh, and since retiring especially from teaching in a one-room high school. Uh, he's become a prolific author and, and, and his works are just fantastic. What he's going to discuss with us today is a discussion over the ways historians work and it is just fascinating to hear his perspective over how we perceive time and our place in time. Ray? Thank you, and I love, I love speaking to a hometown crowd. It's great, you know. Play, basically, I'm playing a home game. I will start with a historical document, okay? How historians work. Can anybody see this? Okay. Um, scribbled right in here about 10 minutes ago is my opening line, <laughs> which I will now deliver. Um, okay, I, I'm going to be talking about the nature of history, and that's going to take us a few, few different places. But uh, basically, how do we know what we know? How well do we know what we think we know? And why the heck do we care about any of this anyway? Because, you know, the truth is, the past is so yesterday. <laughs> you know, so, you know, so like, why, why are we bothering with this? Um, and so, I asked myself that, having spent about you know, half, uh, half a century mired in the past. Uh, rest assured, I don't think I've missed a single day kayaking because I had to be mired in the past. So I, I do have a perspective on these things, but it does make you wonder, doesn't it? Like, why are, you spending, why are we spending so much time on the past? And uh, there's a lot of, you know, we, we learn from history and so on, but I think on a personal level, uh, there's something else going on. I, I think uh, history is kind of a time travel. And here's a, here's a, uh, a quote from uh, novelist L.P. Hartley in the mid-20th century. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. So time travel, I think we do it somewhat the same way people travel in time, uh, I mean in space, you know, to a foreign country. We want to find out, we want to get perspective on our lives. You know, we're kind of constrained in our own narrow little existence. And we would like some kind of uh, counterbalance to that kind of egocentric, ethnocentric, uh, uh, you know, um, closed in world that we live in. So we can expand in, t in space, we can go traveling, or we can uh, go in back in time. And we meet people and we have, uh, we get a whole lot of other perspectives. Um, they're similar, but there's kind of a special challenge to time travel. If you go to a foreign country, if you really like it, uh, you can stay there for a while, maybe create a green card, you can become a citizen, and you can really become, you can live inside that foreign country. And sorry to say, folks, you are not going to be able to live inside the past. You just can't do it. Uh, you, can't, you can't live there, and as a matter of fact, not only can't you be a citizen, you can't even get a green card to the past. Uh, that's how sad it is. So the best we can, any of us can do is become a tourist. Now, there's tourists and there's tourists, okay? So one way we could become a tourist uh, in, in um, let's say, let's compare it now with a, to a foreign country. Uh, a tourist in a foreign country, you could go on a cruise ship uh, with 100, maybe 1,000 people, uh, disembark at a port, go on shore, 
buy a few trinkets to prove you are there, and then take a selfie to prove you are there, and then uh, re-embark and disappear. And uh, that's, that's one kind of tourist. Now, in a time travel, there's kind of a corresponding way to do that. You can read a few paragraphs in a textbook, and then take a short quiz to prove you were there, and then go on to your math homework. And then, you know, so, but where does that get you? Obviously, that's the kind of tourist w w that we don't want to be. You can, however, be a serious tourist. And you can actually, how do you be a serious tourist? You, you try to learn, take these people on their own terms. You try to read letters and journals and uh, uh, get contemporaneous accounts uh, from, uh, from the papers or whatever you can do. If there's uh, arts, art and artifacts, all kinds of ways where you're trying to immerse yourself in their world even though you can't live inside their world, you can sort of immerse your mind, at least get some sort of like, uh, 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 some sort of relationship, deep relationship with that world. And, uh, you know, we've seen some of that here uh, uh, today, people with a deep relationship in the world. Some of it's troubling, certainly that uh, slavery in Humboldt was a particularly memorable uh, bit of, of immersing one, you know, immersing a scholar, immersing herself within that world and, and, and really coming up in some sense with a richer perspective of, of, of uh, what life was like in the past. So, um, so we do that. now. Uh, in educational circles, there's a term thinking historically. That's kind of a buzz term. You know, how do we think historically? And, and I have I've kind of like come up with a sort of rubric for that, uh, several parts. The first part is kind of a, starts with that, that idea of the past is a foreign country. They can do things differently there. And it's another, I'm going to start with this other quote, and this is from uh, historian Richard Wright. Any good history begins in strangeness. The past should not feel comfortable. The past should not be a familiar echo of the present. And that's a, you think about that, because so how do we get from our own present world into a past world without projecting ourselves inside it? Um, and we, it, there's never going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence with the, na the narrative that we create of the past and what the past actually happened. And we have to just accept that up front. So what do we do? Uh, so we do our research, but then within our research, um, uh, what, what do we do? We basically construct narratives. Uh, the history is entirely constructed. There's, you know, we, we start from, from nothing and we're constructing stories. And why do we construct stories? We construct stories because that's what humans do. Think about story. What is the one activity other than the auto, autoimmune, I mean the automatic nervous system that happens in heart pumping and so on? What is the one thing that you do 24-7? And that is tell stories. In the daytime we tell stories and at night we dream. Right? We're always telling stories. And stories is a fundamental organizing principle to the human, to the human consciousness. That's how we kind of make sense of things. So we are going to be, uh, we, we are going to be telling stories. That's, you know, when you get all these, these documents that you're, you know, uh, uh, Don Tuttle just said, how many pages do you have of your, of your, uh, uh, your work in notes? You know, he said, I don't know, he just told me, 1,200 pages or something, Don, he could tell you. And so like, but what, where's the, how how do you get the story out of it, okay? And first off, we admit the story is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. Second of all, we, we say, wait, there are better stories and, there are, there, and you can judge stories, one better than the other. How do you do that? You don't do it by experiments. There's no such thing as historical experiment. Okay, let's all go back to this and recreate. The whole thing about it, it, science is it has to be, uh, you have to be able to recreate the experiments. Try that in history, right? Uh, it's not going to work. So basically you have your evidence and you just, the only correction you can have is like, you, you, how does it correspond with the existing evidence? And that's, that's the best you can do. Um, so, but you can, there's better ones and worse ones, and, and you, can, you, can, you can go with that. Um, you, can, you can do that, those kinds of tests, and that is why as new evidence comes forward and people have different ways of looking at that evidence, they're constantly revising history. The narrative we have of history is not what uh, Eliot had in Humboldt County in 1881. Right, that's very different, or that Coy had, and whatever, what was that, 1915 or something? Um, so you know, it's 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 different.
different, there's new evidence and there's new perspective. All history is revisionist. So if somebody ever says, oh, you're a revisionist historian, of course. There's no such thing as a non-revisionist historian because that assumes that something happened and then it got set in time and it, everything else is exactly the way it was. It just doesn't, it's not the way, not the way time works. Um, so that's the second step. Now the third one is a bit of a challenge, but it is basically things could have happened differently. Things could have happened differently. And this to me is the only way you can really understand history is you have to get as deeply inside the moment of, of that time and then look at the options that are, are, avail were available to, to, to people at that time. How did they see it? What were their options? And then you might be able to get some sense of what their choices you know, what, uh, you know, uh, what those options were. I've developed uh, for the constitutional revolution and constitution period, I've developed this whole website, um, uh, uh, this whole course, uh, it's on ConSource, the Constitutional Sources Project. You can find it on my website. And what I do is there are, high, there are simulations for high school and, 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 and uh, elementary school students for the revolution, where I put people inside a situation, a simulation as they enter those times. The way most simulations Simulations work as they say, okay, you're the Constitutional Convention. What do you say? What do you, uh, well, you know, should we have a president or not? And the people say, well, I like a president or something. What you're teaching you there, without a whole lot of context, you're, pe you're teaching people to make snap judgments with, with very little information, which is exactly the opposite of what we want to uh, teach people, particularly in this day and age at this time. Um, so what I do is I provide a whole lot of context, and then and then put people in that situation. And like at the Constitutional Convention, you know, how many houses of Congress, uh, this, that, all the, all the different things that can happen. Um, one of my favorite lessons is during the Revolution, you're a slave in Mount Vernon, uh, at Mount Vernon, and the British are, at, on Washington's plantation, the British are advancing towards you. But, uh, you have, uh, there's words uh, that um, six, uh, uh, Four years before, five years before, Lord Dunmore, Lord Dunmore said you'd be free if you join the British. More recently, Clinton says join the British and we'll let you go into the army. He doesn't actually use free, but does he mean it or not? A bunch of people are saying, oh wait, should we flee to the British to try to be free? Think of the variables there. Will I get caught? Will I not? How much do I leave my family here? Can I that? If I flee, will they really honor that? If I don't flee, will they capture me um, and and enslave me and send me to the Bahamas? If I stay, what ha you know? Um, if I you know all sorts of variables. And suddenly you're seeing that enslaved people in Mount Vernon are making reasoned dis uh, choices based on the information that they have, and that's how that, that that's. That's, and then 17 of them wound up fleeing and others didn't. So that's, that's, that's how I get home that, 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 that these kind of decisions that people make, make history. And certainly then I have uh, other things like uh, a whole bunch of stuff at the convention and uh, a bunch of generals, uh, uh, George Washington's uh, uh, council of war, to, you know, debating things. Anyway, that's, things could have happened differently and to enter, you have to, to enter history, you have to enter that moment to get it. Okay. But step four, they didn't happen differently. They happened the way they, they happened. And so you have to look at, well, what were the economic, you know, how did people project uh, the, the, what they thought the results would be uh, to do that? What were the political forces at, 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 uh, that were pushing people one way or the other? Uh, so that's the, and that's really where you get, you get into a really the daily grind of history, trying to understand, you know, the, 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 the ebb and flow, the push and pull of these situations at the time. And there's no, there's no quick and easy uh, uh, answer to that, but that's that's what we do. Uh, finally, uh, the last step in my historical thinking process is uh, uh, inquiry never ceases. Uh, uh, what kind of further questions can we ask? Uh, what 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 sorts of information should we look for uh, to take take this to the next level? So that's the way I see the actual process of of uh, of his of historical of historical thinking. That's what I try to teach when I teach teachers. At, in schools, and hopefully that's in some way what we practice when we do enter history. Um, now, that's kind of the conceptual part of my talk. 
but now I want to do something a lot more fun, uh, for me at least, maybe for you, which is the personal part of the talk. Because uh, remember I said history is story. There wasn't a lot of story in that that I just said. You know, I'm, uh, hopefully people listened carefully and thought about it and maybe, you know, have some impact on the way you view history. But now I want to talk about my personal interface with historical inquiry. Uh, so I'm going to give you a, a little uh, chapter in, I mean, a, a little uh, talk in five, five acts, okay? It's going to be sort of a mini autobiography of a historian. Okay, the first act is, is, is uh, ahistorical. There, at a time when, you know, the time in my life where history did not exist. Okay, and that is, uh, I'm just plopped into the world. I was plopped into the world in the New York General Hospital in 1943, uh, in the middle of the world, uh, you know, in the middle of World War II. Little did I know. Right, uh, and uh, I led a, a middle class uh, life in, in New York. Uh, and uh, what I remember, first memories, of course, were from shortly after the war. I was about five years, four or five years old, uh, living. And what I remember from that is that one of my biggest memories is in order to interface with the world at all, I had to go into an elevator where Jim, the elevator man, would take this little thing that went this way and this way and crank and, and then that you know put the elevator up or down because this was before they had driverless elevators. Um, actually, I was expecting that to be a, a, a kind of a laugh line with a younger audience, but, uh, but with this audience, uh, yeah, so what? We all remember that, you know. <laughs> oh good, I got a laugh finally. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Um, but anyway, so but but I, it, there was that buffer, that, that buffer uh, of of existence, you know. And uh, you know that's what happens with an isolated uh, kid in New York. Well, I grow up, I grow a little longer, move through suburbs, then back to the city. Uh, by the time I'm in high school. Uh, I'm getting some historical consciousness, and and I'm actually listening to folk music, and and I'm listening to Pete Seeger and the song uh, "Talking Union," songs of the Talking Union, and songs of the Spanish Civil War, and I start in this kind of like deep adolescent romantic kind of way. Oh, for a life, a cause to die for, you know, for the Spanish Civil War, anti-fascist, you know, and I'm kind of romanticizing that almost, and. Um, uh, so I'm beginning to get a little sense of history. Uh, then uh, high school ends, and the day after I graduate, by the way, where I was living then, uh, uh, when I graduated school, outside my window, that far out was a brick wall. That was my, okay. So, so the day after high school, pack on my back, I'm headed west, headed west. Take a train to take a train to Chicago, a bus to Rapid City, and all the rest I'm on my own, hiking and hitchhiking, you know, out west. Um, so that's a whole other story. I won't regale you with the adventures there, but there certainly were some. Uh, that's kind of the end of the first act, which was kind of an ahistorical act, except for a brief flirtation in high school. Second act, I'm not a historian yet, but I am participating in history. I am inside history. At the time, it felt like the present. Now we think of it as history. In particular, I'm very deeply enmeshed in the peace and civil rights movements. And, um, and uh, uh, starting in 1962, I, uh, and I spent two summers in the South, one in North Carolina and one in uh, Mississippi during uh, uh, Mississippi Freedom Summer, 1964. And I'm going to tell you a story about that, and, uh, which actually in t involves my, my most, I think, my most profound personal contribution, inadvertent uh, contribution to history. Uh, and that is, y you all know what black power was, right? Black power, okay? And that's kind of the mid to late 60s, and, and w within the movement, the, what it really meant was it was a transference from, from the nonviolent stage to, the, to, to a more aggressive stage, but it also meant, in terms of white people, it meant that black, uh, the, the black activists uh, were saying, before, the first, up till 1965, it was very much of an integrated movement. There were whites and blacks within the movement. And then so, uh, shortly thereafter, they were saying like, okay, black people, we're gonna run this movement on our own. If you're white, go deal with white people, you're the problem. 
And so actually I, I wound up doing that. I wound up teaching uh, in a, uh, you know, I interned in, a, in an inner city school and then I wound up teaching in kind of a, you know, uh, a definitely a sort of a liberal white prep school in San Francisco just before I got here. But anyway, black power, just keep that in mind. And now I'll tell you how I, it's personally relevant. So I drive down to, uh, I'm in an old Nash Rambler. Uh, 19, uh, in 1964, uh, American Motors, lousy car, uh, automatic transmission, and it takes maybe a minute and a half to get up to 60. Okay, so this is, this is relevant to the story now. I'm not digressing. <laughs> So, uh, so I, I arrive at the COFO office, uh, coordinated uh, committee of co uh, federated organizations. Basically, the main organization is SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and that's who I'm working with. And um, and I'm uh, and I have a, a car full of clothing we were to take down there because we did a clothing drive, and and another fellow who was who was going with me. We show up at the office, and they say, "Okay, take these clothes up to Ruralville and deliver them to a woman named." Fannie Lou Hamer, um, and this is now, this is before, this is now, time is always crucial in history. We're now talking like uh, June of, 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 early June of uh, 1964. Uh, a very different story if you talk about like August, I think it was August or September of 1964, a few months later. If you, if you nodded when you heard Fannie Lou Hamer, she's going to be saying at the, at the, uh, on the national TV uh, for the, for the uh, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And, it's for, and it, she, she's the most amazing woman I've ever met in my life. We actually wind up spending the night there. But, First, we have to get there. So we're about to drive away, and they say, hey, um, you and uh, Ray and Fred, take these two SNCC field secretaries with you. So um, Stokely Carmichael and, and Charlie Cobb come with me. Uh, Charlie Cobb, the barefoot poet of the movement, and Stokely Carmichael, uh, some people have uh, nodding their heads. He was the most uh, vibrant SNCC field secretary. I mean, they, they, there was a handful, Ivanhoe Donaldson, John Lewis, Stokely Carmichael, he's in that crowd of about the five, like, notorious notorious SNCC field secretaries, notorious meaning like, just like everybody knew who these guys were. Uh, but he, so he winds up in my car. And, um, and so we're, we're tooting along in the Rambler and, we, and I come to a, um, on the back, on just kind of a regular road in Mississippi and up ahead is a, is a stoplight. And so, I'm, so I say, well, so I stop at the red light. And just as I'm starting to stop, Stokely Carmichael says, what the what are you doing? And he, and he and Charlie are sitting in the back seat and they dive down, they dive down and they, so they won't be seen. And what's going on? Red light, one, one red light in town, crossroads. What kinds of uh, businesses are at crossroads in a rural town? Gas stations, who hangs out at gas stations? Who is hanging out at gas stations, looks inside a, a car with a northern license plate and, an, and blacks and whites in the same car? What do they do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'll tell you what they do. Like, uh, they do what uh, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, two of whom I knew. That's what they do, okay? So, but, so, so he's, and so I, get, I come there, and he starts, Stokely emerges, he says, why are they sending us these greenhorns? They're down here, these greenhorns, they're gonna get us all killed, you know? You know, what do you, anyway. And so, you know, because, and then he explained what was happening, you know. And, and so that's how I think that I contributed to the black power. <laughs> I was the white person who said, who, for whom Stokely was saying, go back and deal with your people, we'll take care of things down here. <laughs> so that I think is my most important contribution to history. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, that said, I, I think I do have some contributions to the writing of history, um, um, which are, uh, you know, uh, they, they might, they're interesting, maybe not quite that interesting, but I'm going to start there, because now, now I'm up to Act 3. Okay, um, uh, Act 3 is, is um, I, I'm in the movement, end of the 60s, and... Uh, 
and kind of things sort of grind to a halt. The movement itself starts imploding. It's, you know, the, the, uh, the riots, the 18, uh, 1968 riots, and then the SDS splintered into the weathermen and all this stuff, and meanwhile nothing's changing and the war's grinding on, and you know, it's just ugly. And so people like myself are sort of saying, hmm, we tried that and we're not really getting anywhere, and so we, uh, we, uh, we take off and head to the hills. So uh, this is the, uh, this, so in 1969, uh, finds me now uh, on the beach, on the Needle Rock Beach, in, in, on the Sinkion, you know, the Lost Coast, Sinkion, uh, uh, you know, state wilderness, which by the way, w w the locals, we, we, we were clever on getting that name. Uh, they, we, they didn't want to declare it a wilderness, but we just said, just, if we just could get it sink, named Sinkion, a lot else would follow. And so we pushed hard for that and got it, and a lot else did follow. But anyway, we're winding up at the Needle Rock Beach down, down there uh, by Bear Harbor, south of Shelter Cove. And um, historically, at that time, there was actually a beach there. Now the beach is washed away. There was enough beach there that we had six hippie families, uh, you know, little enclaves. So I'm living in a, in a driftwood hut. Uh, and, it, and it's outside my window, instead of the Instead of a brick wall, I'm feeling the tide, the, the, the waves come in, you know, and then when they come close, we have to like move the hut farther up the beach, right? <laughs> Build a new one, okay? So, so that's the, so now I'm in Humboldt, okay? And uh, so what's a New York kid do, gonna do in Humboldt? Oh my gosh, so like, okay. So sort of through a bunch of circumstances, I wind up studying with, with some other young people from, from, the, from the Bay Area. Uh, with this guy named Harry Roberts. Harry Roberts grew up uh, uh, in Requa. Uh, he wasn't, a, uh, he wasn't uh, Indian blood, but uh, his uh, father worked at the cannery there and his mother taught school there, so that's where he was. And, and he studied with, uh, with Robert Spott. And uh, when I say studied with, that was a time. Now, Robert Spott, by the way, uh, Krober, who wrote the Handbook of California Indians, uh, he, the first, you notice the first three chapters are, are on the Yurok because that was the most preserved Indian, uh, native culture uh, at the time. So he wrote the first three chapters to that. And his main informant was Robert Spott. So the things there that, you know, that, that came down to you know, what he wrote in the, in the book. Now, Harry, the guy who I studied with, learned men's medicine through Robert Spott. So this is a very direct link. I'm getting oral history and now I'm looking at the, you know, the, the anthropological literature and, and oral history the same way. And so we learn all the native plants and I live, lead, lead native you know, plant walks and I'm sort of into that. And you know, what an idea to, to start thinking like what were the native people, um, uh, you know, how did they live here? And then I look around and the place is full of logging roads and stumps and all that kind of stuff. And I say, well, what, what's, what's going on since Native? You know, where the heck am I? You know, the kid from New York is winding up and they whale gulch just looks like that, you know, and it's logged over brushland. One of the old timers says, whale gulch? I said, anybody ever live in whale gulch? Hell no, wasn't nobody crazy enough till you folks come along. You know? <laughs> so. So, so I started talking to old timers. I said, what's going on? You know, and this is just curiosity. It's just curiosity. Oh, what's going on? What's going on? And then I talked to more old timers, more old timers. And then um, uh, what, somebody says, oh, you know, you really should talk to this guy, Guy Curlis. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, because, I mean, you want some stories. You get some stories from him. You know, he was, he was, a, he, he was a fish and game. And he, he basically backwood trapper, moonstone day, I mean, moonlighting days, all that kind of stuff. So, so I, I hitchhike from Whale Gulch. Takes me about four hours to get out to Holmes and I get out there and knock on the door and I say, hey, I want to interview you. And you know, by, by this time I'm realizing I'm, I'm collecting them. I'm thinking I'm going to have to put this together in a book. And so I say, uh, you know, and I said, he says, hell no. I said, can I talk to you? Hell no. Why? Some of the folks are still alive. <laughs> I had to hitchhike all the way back. Never, Guy Curlish, you'll notice a conspicuous absence. 
of Guy Curlis in that book. Oh, well, that was sad. Years later, it turns out somebody from the Historical Society, I don't know, did get through to Guy Curlis. And in the old timers' tapes there, uh, is that, it's called something like that, isn't it? The old timers' tapes? If you go to this, you know, Historical Society, and, and you can actually listen to the Guy Curlis. So lucky you. So you, now that I've advertised it, you'll have to sign up, I guess, for any. <laughs> Years later, um, our son Nick, he, he, uh, he, he broke his hand. Uh, he, no, he didn't break his hand. He cut off of his um, finger in a saw. You know, one of those. Good, Nick was a was a um, old timer before his time. I mean, he worked all over this, the the, uh, the 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 county doing all kinds of work. This time he was working with uh, Michael Evanson in a remill, and he cut off. So he couldn't he couldn't work anymore. So I employed him to help me do transcripts for two people's one place, right? And so there he is with his left hand listening to Guy Curlis and transcribing it for me. So, uh, anyway, a special, special multi-generational moment and personal and, and moment in my life was that. Okay, so um, y you get the idea that, I really, uh, that I'm into Humboldt history now. I stay in Humboldt history. Because I started with all those oral histories, I really, I play with the idea that history is story, history is story, history is stories about individuals. And all my Humboldt books are pretty much focused on those individuals. And years later, as I transfer what you're about to hear, into, into uh, uh, the American Revolution, that too is focused on, on, on concrete stories. You know, that's, that's, that's where it all starts. Um, that book winds up getting published um, kind of by a fluke, uh, super fluke, and by a big press in New York, and go, does very well, and suddenly I'm a writer, so then, so I do all these other books, and uh, in, in, on local books, including the, the uh, uh, the most rewarding book that I've ever done, really on the uh, deepest level, is uh, was the Two Peoples One Place because that was a community effort, and you know there's a it's just a quantum leap between writing your own book about history and your own perspective and so on, and working with a bunch of people who are just throwing you stuff, you know, and actually doing things that are really by and for the community. And so uh, it it's really is my most satisfying work in terms of um, uh, just the whole process, you know, the whole process. Because uh, writing can be somewhat of a lonely occupation. And to, to have it really be this joint effort is, is really, really special. Uh, somewhere along this line, by the way, I'm still doing all this while, t while uh, as Tom said, I'm teaching at this uh, rural, this hill out, uh, still this little hippie hill out in the school, uh, school out in the hills. And I'm working on some curriculum. I, I, I'm deeply committed to curriculum thinking. I mean, criti critical thinking. I, I'm trying to organize the whole. Pro I'm doing the whole high school thing. I'm trying to do the whole process, the whole high school curriculum based on critical thinking. Because to me, that's that's the basis of it all. If you if you know if you can do critical thinking, you can do anything. Uh, that's the fundamental tool, and I still believe that. So I was going to—I had this idea of a critical thinking textbook, and I said I'm going to try this out, and I'm going to start with the American Revolution because you got to start somewhere. So I start delving into the American Revolution, and deeper and deeper and deeper. And as my one of my two mentors in that field once said, you know, once people enter the late 18th century, they never fully returned, you know. <laughs> and so since then, and we're talking mid 90s, I've had basically you know uh, you know I've lived you know uh, part-time in Humboldt and part-time in the American Revolution of course I just told you earlier that you can't really live in the past uh, when that's true but my professional life was was split you know my really my, my personal life was here and most of my professional life then became uh, you know really in a different place and we'd go back east and and uh, do archival work and and just get deeper and deeper and deeper into that first book people's history of the American Revolution that was based basically my 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 uh, my work in the civil rights movement uh, showed me that um, it's not all about leaders, it's about people, and so I and and that you know things you kind of at that time of your life you know you get onto a certain. Uh, path and you kind of let, that, that shapes the way you think. So I always sh uh, thought in terms of common people, and so I. Um, uh, so the first book was uh, was uh, the People's History of the American Revolution: How Common People Shaped the Fight for Independence, and uh, again that that proved very successful. So that kind of launched a new career, and. 
Uh, within that, uh, there was a story I uncovered about a common farmers in Massachusetts in 1774, the year before Lexington and Concord. Some of you probably know this story. Um, and they completely overthrew British rule before, six months before Lexington and Concord. I mean, absolutely no British presence anywhere outside of, uh, outside of Boston. A remarkable story, and, and it, has, it is seeping into the mainstream narrative, but what was so most notably, notable then was that it wasn't. How in the world can all, these, you know, all the attention that we give to Lexington and Concord and the revolution, all this stuff, and the first overthrow of, the British, gov uh, of British rule is, doesn't even bear, isn't even mentioned anywhere. In the, in the core narrative. I just found it in a couple of obscure references of, of crowd, un, uh, you know, there's a crowd actions in rural unrest. So I say, I look at them and I see, oh my gosh, you know, half the people of a rural county come up in one day to unseat the British authority. That's more than crowd actions or rural unrest. It was a revolution, which it was. So um, that, that led me to believe, you know, I mean, led me to ask. Remember I said part of the historical method is what questions can we ask? So I said, wait a second, what about all the rest of the stories? What about Paul Revere's ride, Whites of the Rise, all that stuff? And that led to uh, uh, investigation of those. I didn't know where it would lead. It turns out those things were all really concocted in the, term, in the form that we, ha we, we perceive them now in the early 19th century or in the case of Paul Revere, the, uh, you know, 1861. Um, so it's a whole other way of looking at history uh, that, you know, you, you look at stories and it's all about stories, but once again, historical method, how do we evaluate these stories? So to me, any history has to in, include kind of the historiography of whatever subject you're doing, like, you know, when did we first tell, tell that version of history and, and how, how far does it, um, you know, and then uh, it, what, what new questions can we ask and where do we take that? And so, anyway, so that, then I got from once the revolution, then I get into the Constitution, and, uh, and that's sort of where I am now. And uh, it's a timely topic, shall we say. Uh, so I have um, I'll put in a little plug now. Um, my editor, Knopf, wanted me to, uh, um, to do a annotation of the Constitution. And, and uh, most of the, the existing annotations are either school book dry or kind of nut jobs, you know, really, <laughs> frankly, you know, all about Moses' law or something, you know. Um, and so there's, this is a very, a, a very user-friendly, uh, but I think, you know, based on solid ground annotation, and it's not cranky in any way, and it's, you know, anyway, it's over there. It's called the Con U.S. Constitution, uh, explain clause by clause for every American today. Anyway, and then I wrote a couple of other books: the president's creation of the presidency, Mr. President, constitutional myths. So that's kind of where I am right now. I'm 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 uh, working on. I'm sort of you know I've got a done a. I don't want to do book production anymore because uh, somebody just asked me at a party the other night, what do, what kind of exciting projects are you doing? Are you do, are you up to? because I've always had a few books in the works, you know. I said, oh, I'm living. I said, no, 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 what are you doing? What are you, what's your project? I said, I just told you. <laughs> so that's, that's the way I feel, I'm living. And as I said, I've never given up a, a, a history day for a kayaking day, but, but now I just can, you know, I don't know. It, it, that's more my focus. But I do have still a sort of a funny other focus. What about, what about me, my history, my family, you know? So now notice this, I go from a place, the origins, uh, basically the place, and sort of the origins of this place from the, you know, from the uh, human inhabitation of this place, from Native American white presence, two peoples to me. Then I do the origins of my nation, right? And, that, and that's, that's a special appeal about the revolution, is that you're talking about the origins of a nation. And, and now I'm doing the origins of me. And it's, it's, it's really fun, you know, and I, I can do a lot of the, the tools that I have. And now some of this kind of like wide flung research can be done on the internet. Like, you know, the, the, these place names that, that are mentioned in the family lore, you know, I can look them up and find out the history, you know. And it takes me all kinds of places. And I bet every one of these people, everyone here, if you get into your family history, you, it's gonna lead you places you never dreamed of, you know. Uh, turns out on my mother's side, I have, uh, I have, I, I, pre, I predate the Mayflower, 
coming over in, eight, in 1560s to, the, to Quebec. And then from there, you know, the French Canadians, and then to make a living, they, after the fur, after the fur stuff, it was lumber, but then the lumber got, uh, went belly up, so they moved to upstate New York, and they wind up here, and then the guy gets uh, wounded in the Civil War, he becomes a baker, you know, you know the, all that stuff. And then another story is like uh, my great-grandma on the maternal side, uh, she's in the Civil War. Uh, she's, uh, she never knows her dad. Her mother dies when she's seven. Because the dad, her mother was basically a single mom. Who, I don't know what happened, deserted, whatever. And so she gets adopted. She comes out west, actually, uh, with a fellow who had come earlier in a, in a 49er. And, he's, uh, and he blinded himself in the mines, and he still mined, and then he went back to get the family, including my great-grandmother, and she comes out here in Rough and Ready, and they're at age 19, where all the, uh, all this, they still had a bunch of uh, miners and camps there. She gets pregnant, okay, so then, so, so, but th so that guy, that's father number two disappears, because who knows? She goes and marries her uncle up in Boise, and then he dies, and then, um, and then she marries somebody else who leaves, and then one of her, and she had no, another couple of kids, and one of them uh, falls into a pot of boiling water and dies, because she's a washerwoman. And then, and then she marries another guy uh, who has my grandmother, you know, with her, and then he leaves. And then it turns out, fast forward a generation, my grandmother uh, becomes a single mom in the, in the Depression. So I've got like, like these four, you know, single mom things, you know, and suddenly, this, this white, middle-class, privileged male, and I'm thinking about these washerwoman women, and, and you see what I'm saying about expanding your horizons, you know? And then on my dad's side, you know, that's all Russian Jew, you know? And uh, my mom's side then was also a bunch of like Irish, you know, fam Irish famine and all that kind of stuff. My dad's side's Russian Jew, and my grandfather, um, so my grandfather, um, he, he was born in, in they, they sort of, they, the Jews then, they didn't really have a nation, so it's, they said Russian, Poland, uh, Lithuania, whatever, but, but it's all in this, really the same. But he's under Russian rule, and he's trying to escape from being drafted into the Tsar's army. Uh, which was uh, the Tsar just loved. Uh, he let the, he let the women out of the out of town easy, you know, but the men he wanted to keep keep on. But they they were handy cannon fodder, you know. You draft them in and and uh, and, and can put them wherever you want. So he wanted out. So he hid in a hay wagon, and gets to the border. This this is a family tale, and so you don't know if it's totally true, but usually there's sort of a you know, you can corroborate some of it. I'll never be able to get the official record of what happened because what happened in this story is he's in the hay wagon and the, the border guard goes with his pitchfork. And as you know by my presence here, he missed. Okay. Um, meanwhile, my grandmother, uh, who was just, but who was just actually. Um, not far away from there, only 100 miles or so, but actually kind of on German rule, uh, control then. And um, uh, she, she comes over here, but she has, she, has, uh, uh, you know, she has a bunch of siblings. Some, make, some come here and some don't. This is the 1880s. The ones who don't wind, wind up in Germany in the 1930s. So one of my grandmother's, one of my grandmother's brothers is still there. And, and he has seven kids. And then those seven kids, and one of those seven kids, Marie and I got to know quite well, so we got a very, very clear story about this. Four of those kids made it out, and three did not. And then the stories of how they made it out and everything. Um, and then the three, of the three who did not, so these are my father's generation, uh, one of them had two kids. So I have second cousins who were camped in Auschwitz, okay? Pretty much simultaneous with my birth, 1943, okay? So I'm gonna close with this little statement, brief statement here, about don't anybody ever tell you that, that little things don't matter, that history doesn't matter. Pitchfork, bam, 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 miss. I'm here, Cousins Auschwitz. And it's all, you know, it's, it's, um, it's so profound 
what can happen, what didn't happen, um, how precarious life is, but how contextualized everything is. None of this was in really anybody's personal control in terms of like, this is something we can experience today. You know, We are in one of those times right now where we don't know. We don't know how this is going to turn out. And, uh, but, but somehow, um, it's not just about us, it's about everything, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a time to connect with humanity. And history is just a super way to do it. We are time traveling. We were trying to engage with people in different times, different experiences. And for that, everyone in this room, I know, and I guarantee that you are involved in a noble enterprise. I would love some questions or interchange because I've done my work and now comes the fun part. I just, I want to interchange. A couple of things before we get rolling here. One, uh, Ray has also opened up some time to uh, sign his books. He's got quite a few of them there at Humboldt Books. Thank you for coming out here as well. So at the end of this, we could do that. The other, if you have questions for him, you could either ask him directly on this mic, and I'm sorry, it's, it's a cabled mic, I can't hold it around, or you could ask me and I'll put it in the mic because we're filming this and it's got to be recorded. So what questions do we have? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed. You're a great storyteller. Uh, I think everybody here appreciates that part of it. But um, I've always been saying that we can't go forward without knowing the past. Um, I, I've connected the two. I, I try to leave my life that way. Um, can you talk about that? I think you have a lot of people here that are interested in the past. Mm -hmm. So that must mean that we're a great group for going forward. Mm -hmm. can, can you elaborate a little bit on the past future connection? I'm yeah. sure you have your own opinion. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely the past gives us great insights into, uh, you know, into how one thing led to another. Uh, one thing led to another. It's, it's great insights there. Actually, I want, I'm going to get to your question, but it just reminded me of something, how one thing leads to another. A little piece that I left out in the talk, which is, I am an, spoken about past and leading on, I am such a stickler for chronology. You know how they say all we learn in school is dates and place, I mean people in place, or dates and dates? You're darn straight you learned your dates. And if you don't have your dates straight, you don't have anything straight. Consider this. I am studying uh, the attitudes of, of, of Americans towards Muslims in the early aught years. And I have a couple of, so I've got a couple of samples here, just I'm going to make a generalization. And I have a sample, on, oh yeah, this interview I took on September 10th, 2001. And then here's another one I took on September 12th, 2001. So, oh yeah, yeah, don't you think the exact date matters? Yeah, you see, so that's my example. So the first thing is, you know, everything happened at a time and a place. And unless you fully contextualize that, you will not be able to transfer to the, to the future. Now, one thing that's bothering me about the, the current political discourse is so much as a, a people are saying, well, here's an impeachment thing now, and here's what historically has happened in, with Andrew Johnson and Clinton and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, or these things. So many, you know, okay, that was then and this is now. And some of those things might, so much has changed now. Like, we do not know the full impact of this information, uh, 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 self-insulating feedback, you know, machine, where people don't have this common source of information. There is no historical precedent for that. The only historical precedent for that would be tribal societies. Where, each, where every person only got you know, their information from one, one side or the other. But uh, so anything that, when, when people say this is unprecedented, uh, we, it is an unprecedented situation that we live in now. Um, that said, people act as they act, and, and um, you, know, you, you, want to, you want to get a sense of it. But there are limits. Um, to how much you can project. It's not a science, and because something happened one way in the past doesn't mean it's going to happen that way in the future. Um, there's also a difference that, you know, this is um, something that uh, 
that Obama has said recently, he's folk, he, he keeps referring to the long arc of history. And, and there's the short arc and the long arc of history. And it's very hard to predict really, you know, as now, it's hard to predict kind of anything. Um, and certainly where the long arc is gonna go. But I still think it's worthwhile. I don't think you can come to like conclusions or predictions, you know? I don't think you can do a Nate Silver 538 kind of prediction on this or do odds on this. But I can't, I can't help but thinking that some knowledge of how human beings work and have worked is, is going to be useful in understanding things and hopefully, hopefully figuring out some way to uh, uh, cross-communicate in our, you know, bifurcated society. Yeah. Um, this is just part of your anecdotal history, the little incident with Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, Stokely Carmichael. Mm -hmm. I sort of missed the exact incident, and I was wondering if you could elaborate the story a little bit more with, with your, the, the way you felt at the time, and um, whether you were just being flippant when you said this, you thought this was a, a terminal moment in Stokely Carmichael's history. Okay. Yeah. You could just elaborate the yeah, story. Yeah, 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 that's great. Yeah, of course it wasn't a terminal moment in Stokely Carmichael's history. I'm sure he had numerous such other moments uh, dealing with other uh, greenhorn uh, uh, people from the north. But I do know, so this is, I'm glad you asked me to elaborate because uh, at that night, I mean, I was pretty much shaken, you know, personally, you know, to be chewed out by this, like, famous field secretary right then, and clearly traumatized, I'm telling it to you today. Uh, uh, and, and, but he was already kind of a little bit, you know, he, he was, he was a hard-edged guy, you know. Charlie Cobb, by the way, was this beautiful barefoot poet, the sweetest guy in the world, and he since, and he got very involved in the Freedom Schools. I haven't met him since, but I remember, if, I've tried to look him up, and he's involved in some kind of wonderful education project of some sort, I can't remember what it was. Fannie Lou Hamer, that's what I want to elaborate on. My night with Fannie Lou Hamer. She, she, she comes there, first of all, I show up, they sent me up there. Fannie Lou Hamer, the sweetest, gentlest woman in the world, absolute Christianity to the core. And, and Stokely, when we get there, he says, you stay here, I better knock on the door. He knocks on the door and Fannie Lou, and, and Fannie Lou Hamer opens it and she's carrying a rifle. Yeah. And so, of course, you know, but it's so, so it's kind of good. I mean, she wouldn't have shot us, but, you know, but it's still, you know, that Stokely knows that, you know, you, he better do it. See, um, I don't know, um, I think it was somewhat naive or the, uh, the people who sent me there, to, but, anyway, but they knew Fannie Lou Hamer would accept us, and she did. My night with Fannie Lou Hamer was the most memorable night, you know, oh, God. I mean, being in her presence, she totally embraced what we were doing. We knew that, that our job was to call national attention, you know, to call national attention to this, and, and it worked. You know, we did our part. We did our part. We called national attention to what was happening in Mississippi. There were five black activists killed in Mississippi in the, in the five months preceding Freedom Summer that nobody knew about. And the three that are killed afterwards, the Aunt Sharon and Shane and Goodwin, that huge national attention, you know. And so, yeah, we did, we did play a role, and, 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 uh, but that's part of history, that's part of what, and, and my mother was, was I, I, my mother has, there's a, some, somebody called me up, a high school friend who worked with, um, uh, and, anyway, called me up, well, yeah, there's a, she went to saw, see her senator, her New York senator, to try to get federal protection for us, you see what I mean? So like that's the that's the kind of, we were kind of a pawns in the game, but we played our part, you know. Uh, so it, it was it was a historical thing. That's what I, I don't believe any too many of the things are the pivotal moments in anyone's life. I think most of them are kind of trends, and I think uh, that just exemplifies a trend that I was a naive greenhorn uh, that was potentially a danger to people, uh, but we we played a part and we and and it, and it worked. There was great national attention. Do we have any other questions? Could I repeat a question? Don't okay. be shy. Now, if I don't hear one more question, I'm not going to talk to anybody individually. <laughs> you, you don't wait till afterwards, and then I have to talk to you and nobody else gets to hear. Okay, yeah. Could you repeat it? Yeah. When she says it? You can stand up here. Come on. Yeah. 
She's not afraid of a microphone. She knows what's up. Just what exactly happened when you stopped in the middle of the town and they ducked? Oh, uh, we stopped in the middle of the town and they ducked. That's what was happened. It stoplight? Yeah, stoplight. Yeah, yeah. So he yeah. was saying, don't stop. No, oh, 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 yeah, okay. I, I, thank you for asking. The little thing that I think that's not making this click for some people is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to see the Mississippi, it's flat. It's delta time. It's flat roads, straight roads, flat roads, you know. If it's flat, it's going to be straight. I could have seen that traffic light easily a quarter mile away. I would have timed it green. till it's green. And that's what everybody who lives, thank you, for, Helen, for asking this. Yeah, right, to, to get the story. And everybody who's, who's like, these guys have, for years, have been going on plantations and driving there and surviving. You know, they knew every little thing. And now, by the way, the other thing that I didn't really make clear is, is how terrible it was to have a Nash Rambler that took a minute and a half to get up to 60 degrees. Do you see what I'm saying? I didn't clarify that story enough. Yeah, that, right. So, so you know, the, the, car wasn't, the car wasn't up to the task and the driver wasn't up to the task of doing the job that, that we were supposed to do in Mississippi. Right? Okay, now finally it clicks for everybody. You got it? Now this shows you to not be shy. Okay? If she hadn't come through that question, she would have asked me in person and none of you would have known all the, the, the perfect details of it. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. Okay, is anybody else not want to be shy? I'm, oh, good, yeah. I've heard that there are prohibition cases behind the Fire Harbor. You know what I'm talking about? Wait, wait. Uh, I've heard that there's some prohibition history related to Fire Harbor. I'm oh, yeah, okay, well, um, yeah, yeah, prohibition history, yeah. Uh, uh, I got this from Glenn Strong, Look in Everyday History, and uh, which is easily, uh, there's copies there. And, and if you're in Southern Humboldt, probably uh, any house will have one. If you're in Northern Humboldt, some of them will have them. They're, they're easily had. It was written, whatever, 45 years ago. It's, uh, it's out of print. The fifth printing just sold out. It's coming out again. It's a classic, you know, it's just, it's a, what I like about everyday history is it's, you know, wide-eyed hippie comes to the hills, what does he find? You know, and people say, do you want to update it? No way, it can't be updated. It's wide-eyed hippie comes to the hills and what does he find, you know? And so Glenn Strawn, you'll read about uh, in Glenn Strawn's interview there, who's, uh, who's just this oh, beautiful man. Read that, some of the great interviews, Fred Wolf for color and Glenn Strawn for just breadth of experience. And he talks about the prohibition and the mother ships and coming on shore and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so that's your source, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, I, uh, have you thought about writing a sequel to Two People's One Place, or is anyone else working on that? It seems like there's a lot of history between 1885 or whatnot and, and now, right? Uh, yes, there's a lot of, his, lot of history since then, and, and precisely, and in a sense that's the problem, uh, because nobody has come forth. Um, it, was a, it was a monumental task. Yeah. Uh, I did it in three shifts between revolution books. And I had, I had, you know, uh, you know, also, you know, Edie and Joan who were here, uh, you know, Arlene, all kinds of, Don Tuttle was the chairman of the thing, you know, and Jerry Rohde who knows everything about everything, you know. All these people were feeding, feeding me things. And even so, and it was a more confined thing. You know, like you think of the, 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 the theme, two people's one place, and that permeates the whole book. Now, from the 1880s on, we would love to have that. And everybody has been asking, you know, can somebody please write that? Uh, but full disclosure, whoever does it, it's going to be a monumental task. And if, if it happens, it, uh, it has to be a community effort. People have to feed this person. And perhaps people might have to feed them in terms of paying them. Uh, you know, because it's, it, it's such a time-consuming thing. It would love to do. Remember, the, the idea behind that is there were two components. We were going to do it two ways. Uh, myself and Freeman. Uh, Freeman came on board uh, to do the early stuff. He, was, he wanted to do that, and I had too much work anyway, so we did that, and it worked out great. Um, uh, we were going to do the, the first volume, and then somebody else was going to do the second volume. Meanwhile, Jerry was going to do the place by place, and we called it the warp and the woof, or the basket, so you can kind of get it from two directions. And Jerry, of course, is continuing, and he reports that he's just, you know, uh, not far away. You know, he's, he's, you know, he's got whatever, 
300,000, 400,000 words and he only has 50,000 more to go or something like that, you know. So look forward to that, Southern Humboldt. I wish somebody would, please. Anybody? Can you, can you get a partner to do it? Can you join? Somebody should do it. Yeah, we all wish. Um, I was wondering if you speak to your experience or any understanding of just like the, um, the return of Dulawat that recently happened and how... The what? Uh, Tulawat Island, Indian Island, returning. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and just even like the changing of the name from Indian Island to Tulawat and how um, it's retelling a story and it's like moving the story in the future and just how is um, retelling those stories and reframing the stories of the past? Um, have you see, seen any experience of using history as a tool for healing, as a way to deal with issues that have been uh, problematic in the past? Yeah, well, I think you just mentioned an instance of it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, and, and this is happening all over, I mean, in all kinds of ways. You know, like, I can't remember when I said, I think I just worked this in, if I, if I missed it, when I mentioned history at the very beginning, I was supposed to say history or herstory. I don't know if I did it or not. Um, but, uh, but I should, you know, I mean, this is the kind of thing. Just as these things, if they start out feeling a little contrived, you know, and so, um, and, and so that's the way they're going to start. And hopefully then they kind of like sink in and people really get it, um, you know, with generations. It, it's certainly empowering to the people who are managed, managed to get these things done. Um, it can be overdone um, in terms of energy. Uh, Marie and I were down uh, walking uh, through Sproul Plaza at UC Berkeley. And, you know, where they, everybody's, you know, they're not quite as much activists now. Instead of the activists, most of the booths are are um, are, are startup business oriented booths, you know. And how, anyway, but uh, but there was one gal making these posters, you know, passing posters, and yet everybody has their little cause down there, you know. So it was, so there's probably maybe 75 posters on something this big, and she had her one poster, and she was tacking her one poster over all the rest, <laughs> and and. Um, and I talked to her, and she's, I said, hey, you know, I, 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 I don't know what your cause is, but, you know, do you really think it's worth, you know, you, shouldn't, you should take advantage? And so she said, okay. And so she did, and, and then uh, she walked to the other side of the bulletin board and kept pasting it over all the rest. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I'm mentioning this because her cause was renaming one of the buildings, you know? And, and I thought, well, uh, that, that's probably, I think that's a good thing to do. But I think you have to keep it in perspective, the extent to which these, these kind of culture things are, 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 can dominate a narrative in people's, uh, um, you know, I think, I think that's a particular example. And I certainly don't think the, the renaming of the island is that example. I think that is 100%. And I, I think now, I mean, they probably I mean, this is the this is the thing that everybody you know. I mean, it it's so central to Eureka culture, you know, to re Eureka heritage and everything, that that it's really critical to do that. But people and I and I realize a lot of this is happening on campuses, and a lot of the right wing reaction to it, and they're kind of playing on this, is the emphasis on the culture war, and so what they consider politically correct, um, is it can be. Um, it's just out of proportion when you, when you take it down to the minute. So that's my, I think it's a good thing and to keep it in, within reason and keep it, keep the, but not dominating the entire discussion. Like perhaps for instance, not then saying that uh, that, that island should have 50% of, of all representation in Humboldt County. You know, the inhabitants of that island, how many are on there now? Does anybody, that mayor used to live there, does anybody else live there now? Four houses. Four houses. Four houses. So you could take it, well, you know, uh, we had uh, two peoples, one place. So, um, well, they, well, that, that in, so they should have half the representation and all the rest of Combo should have half the representation. That's what you, you hear what I'm saying, just keep it in perspective. We're running a little late, but we have time for one more question. Hey, Ray. Yeah. Um, you mentioned it earlier that, you know, history is consistently being revised yeah. and, and I, I, I think uh, there are many people in the room who um, suffer from the belief that 
what you're doing isn't done. You haven't finished it, you got more work to do, and never get to that point of publishing something, whether at a very small scale or a large scale. And as someone who's obviously overcome that hurdle consistently throughout the years, mm -hmm. um, I'd wonder what types of advice you can offer, what kinds of stress tests you give to your <laughs> what you do, you know, so that you feel mm -hmm. comfortable moving forward. Uh, I think that would be beneficial. You mean for all the people who, who really have something to say, but they're having a hard Hard time really getting getting it out. Cross the finish saying? line. Yeah. Cross the finish line. Okay. So uh, boy, that's a good one. Um, uh, the first one that I want to make clear is some people say, "Oh, uh, you know, you're a writer. Oh, I want to write a book." You know. Well, the first advice is that if you don't really, if you're not passionate about doing something, you know, don't do something because you want to write a book. <laughs> you know. But I, I assume what you're talking about is people who really are do have something going and something that, that they're passionate about. And, uh, you know, my advice is just is going for it. Um, there's two things in terms of publication now. Uh, the standard route of, of, like, finding a publisher and getting it and then getting that publisher to, you know, print 5,000 copies of it or something is, is, is very hard now. Uh, but there's so many alternate routes now. Uh, certainly all the online stuff. I mean, most of the people, people are reading online. And you could get a lot of your research and your stuff out online if, uh, if you make the contacts and try to get to your audience. And then, of course, self-publishing works. If you do self, even if you do any kind of publishing now, you, the author, are expected to do the lion's share of the marketing. Even if you find a publisher, and even if they pay for it, they, they're, before they pay for it, they're going to say, what are you going to do to market this? You know, so you have to have your, your market strategy, your market audience, and you have to do, if you're, if you're going for publisher too, uh, beyond you know, the internet or self-publish, you have to be what's called, do what's called positioning. They're going to ask you, what else is in that field? And how, is yours, how does yours differ or add to that field? Positioning. How are you positioned? So, good luck. Oh, and that said, uh, raise your hand if you're interested in doing the next volume of Humboldt <laughs> History. Oh, oh, this is the perfect way to recruit. If you do that, if that's your thing, you have solved the problem of getting published. You have everyone in this room who's going to jump on you and say, yes, go for it. Here's 10 bucks. We'll feed you all the information you need. So if you want to get published, you know the book that you can get published. OK. Thanks, Ray.